Every year, a primary aspect of the Holocaust Memorial Program is the appearance on campus of a scholar who has done through his writing and his talks a great deal to sharpen our conception of the Holocaust, our awareness of it. Three years ago it was Christopher Browning, two years ago Michael Birnbaum, last year it was Michael Maris. And this year we are very pleased to welcome Professor Lawrence Langer to join us. Professor Langer, to give you a bit of background, received his PhD from Harvard, taught for many years, 35 years, at Simmons College in Boston in the Department of English. He has published four books and many, many articles and chapters of books on the Holocaust, on Holocaust-related themes. He has conducted workshops on the Holocaust, the literature of the Holocaust. He has done more than perhaps any other individual to come to grips with the testimony of the survivors of the Holocaust. For many years he worked extensively with the literary uh, contributions of survivors, but over the past eight or nine years he's been focusing more and more on oral testimony, taking advantage, as has no other scholar to the same extent, of the extraordinary resource that is the Fortunoff Video Archive at Yale University that contains the testimony of more than 2,400 survivors, many of whom, by the way, have been uh, videotaped and interviewed by Professor Langer himself. So right now, I would like to welcome Professor Lawrence Langer to speak to us. The title of his talk is going to be Memories Time, Chronology and Duration in Holocaust Testimonies. Thank you very much. Can you hear me in the back? Oh. Thank you very much for that gracious introduction. I'm happy to be here. I'm also happy to be, to have such a uh, distinguished set of predecessors over the last three years. I'd like to talk a little bit about the problem of facing the Holocaust, and I like to illustrate it by showing you excerpts from tapes. When I'm finished, um, I hope we can have a dialogue. I'll respond to any questions, or I'll exchange discourse with anyone who would like to. That's the part I enjoy most. Some of you must have seen in the papers a day or two ago the results of a Roper poll, um, which discovered that 24% of adults questioned believed that it was possible that the Holocaust never happened, and 12% of high school students questioned weren't sure whether it was possible or not, possible or impossible for the Holocaust to have happened. When Elie Wiesel was told this, he almost had a heart attack. And um, one understands in a more serious vein why someone like Primo Levi committed suicide at the end of his life uh, from a feeling in part that after all the books that he had written, he felt audiences still didn't understand and many of them didn't care about what happened. The most bizarre thing about this Roper poll, and I don't know how much you can trust them, they only interviewed 945 people altogether, but statisticians say that that's enough to get some kind of valid, uh, some kind of valid sense uh, of how people feel. Imagine if I came to you and said, I'm from the Roper poll, and I'd like you to answer this question. Do you think it's possible that the American Civil War never happened? Or do you think that it's possible that World War I never took place? You would think I were a lunatic. I mean, you wouldn't even respond to the question. The bizarre thing is that people respond seriously to the question, do you think it's possible that this historical event never took place? 
Well, of course it took place. Why do some people then say they think it's possible that it didn't take place? And it's not just that merely would like to say people are stupid, and that's why they say it, but that's not, the, that's not the answer. Deep down, somewhere in a lot of us, is a need to believe that something like the Holocaust is exaggerated and didn't really happen. That accounts for the success of the revisionists in claiming that and there were gas chambers when, of course, there were gas chambers. And uh, some people saying, I think it's possible it never happened. Uh, why? There's no place to fit the Holocaust into history as we understand it. Um, imagine 50 years after World War I having annual commemorations of World War I. By 1968, most people in America probably couldn't remember when World War I ended. But here I am in 1993, 48 years after the event, and you've had a full week of commemoration of this event. And one reason is that we don't know where to put it into the stream of history so it becomes like every other historical event because it's not like every other historical event. Chronological time, which I'll say more about later on, is defined by sequence. We have a past, we have a present, we have a future. The Holocaust was an event without a future. People in the camps felt that their future was to be killed in the camps. Very few people thought about what I'll do after the war. They talked about it sometimes, but if you listen to the testimonies, they all believed their destiny was to be killed. Um, there are causes and consequences of the Civil War. A favorite exam question is list the causes of the Civil War. What were some of the results of the French Revolution? Monarchy was dead. Napoleonic laws established for the first time a kind of code of laws applying to all people. If one were to list the good consequences of the Holocaust, one would be faced with um, a silent tongue and a blank uh, page. There are no good consequences of the murder of two-thirds of European Jewry. And so we struggle, as we talk about the Holocaust, to find some place to put it. Um, there is no place in history for this unprecedented event, and it's partly because, and it's taken me some time to discover this, partly because we lack a form of discourse of, or a vocabulary to put it somewhere else. So instead of reformulating how we might conceive of this event in a new way, we lapse into traditional language of heroism, of strength of the spirit, scarcely a new book on the Holocaust comes out that doesn't have somewhere on the jacket or the back of the paper jacket um, the statement, this book represents the triumph or illustrates the triumph of the human spirit. Anne Frank's diary represents the triumph of the human spirit. Uh, as she lay dying in uh, Bergen Belsen, Anne Frank would have been delighted to hear that that's what her story represented. Since we don't have a language or a tradition for dealing with the unprecedented, the easiest way of responding is to use familiar language and to transform the event into something more manageable and less oppressive. This makes everyone feel better. It makes the writer feel better, the speaker, the audience, future generations. Whether it also reflects the truth, I'll let you decide as this talk proceeds and as you see fragments from survivor testimony. Um, there are two ways of viewing the Holocaust. The way it was and rhetorical eff uh, efforts to modify the grimness of the event by using language to uh, alter the way it was. Let me give you an example of the latter or the second first. Um, I want to read you the last paragraph of what, in fact, is a very important book about the Holocaust by British historian Martin Gilbert called The Holocaust, A History of the Jews of Europe during the Second World War. And that is based, on, it's a book of 850 or more pages, and it's a relentless book. It's based on testimony, or um, audio tape testimony rather than videotape testimony, of many, many survivors. Uh, Gilbert rounded up survivors from shtetls and towns and villages, camps all over Europe and talked to them, and wrote this very painful account. And at the very end, this is how he closes the book. Now just imagine, a lot of people who get discouraged by 850 page books turn to the end to see how it comes out and read the last paragraph first. Uh, imagine getting a sense of the Holocaust by reading this paragraph first. This is the last paragraph of this book. In every ghetto, in every deportation train, in every labor camp, even in the death camps, the will to resist was strong and took many forms. 
fighting with those few weapons that could be found, fighting with sticks and knives, individual acts of defiance and protest, the courage of obtaining food under the threat of death, the nobility of refusing to allow the Germans their final wish to gloat over panic and despair. Even passivity was a form of resistance. To die with dignity was a form of resistance. Notice how language takes over the reality and almost creates the reality here. To die with dignity was a form of resistance. To resist the dehumanizing, brutalizing force of evil. To refuse to be abased to the level of animals. To live through the torment. To outlive the tormentors. These two were resistance. Merely to give wist witness by one's own testimony was, in the end, to contribute to a moral victory. Simply to survive was a victory of the human spirit. Simply to survive was a victory of the human spirit. Now, by creating a heroic framework for what was nothing more than mass murder, because that's what he's talking about in the book, Gilbert gives his readers a chance to link it to a tradition of resistance and dignity that in turn restores possibility to what we thought was impossible. Because if death in the ghettos and labor in death camps can be allied to a victory of the human spirit, then it can't have been so grim, and we can accept it despite its melancholy implications. Particularly for people who don't have a living memory of the Holocaust, this rhetorical flourish, this last paragraph, offers an escape from the defeat of the human body, nearly six million human bodies, by means of the victory of the human spirit. So keeping in mind Gilbert's um, verbal formulation of what the camp experience was like, you know, a triumph of the human spirit, uh, contrast it with a visual image of what the camps were like, or one camp was like Buchenwald on the day it was liberated. Now, uh, some of you may have seen this on PBS a month or two ago. It was called The Liberators, and it focuses on some black Afro-American uh, units, soldiers in World War II, who came upon Buchenwald. Uh, a scandal resulted when um, some people familiar with the military history of the time pointed out that the units used in this film were nowhere near Buchenwald at the time of the liberation, and the producers of the show just flew over some black, former black soldiers and claimed they were there. They withdrew the film, and now they're deciding whether to redo it or discard it or to use it anyway. Uh, the one black former GI you see here uh, was, admits that he was there at least for two hours. His unit moved through didn't liberate it, but he was there for two hours, and he describes what he saw. But that aside, let's look at the first uh, fragment now. Why do you not wear clothes? Because I never thought it would be When I walk to the gate, I saw in front of me what I now refer to as the walking dead. I saw human beings Keeping in mind this particular moment representing the liberation of the camp and what the survivors look like, and then going back to 
Gilbert's lines, merely to give witness by one's own testimony was in the end to contribute to a moral victory. Simply was to survive was a victory of the human spirit. Gilbert in that last paragraph, and I'll never understand why he felt he needed to write it. I sometimes think his publishers said to him, Martin, you can't end the book the way you ended it. We need something uplifting. And this is certainly uplifting. It restores the experience to chronological time. If people's bodies were destroyed and some bodies survived, the spirit remain uninjured, and we can think of this as some kind of triumph leading toward a future existence. It makes it easier to assimilate. What I call durational time, and I'll talk more about that later on, are these fixed moments that we look at and are unable to get beyond. <clears throat> you can't look at them and say, well, they're walking skeletons now, but a year from now they'll be back to normal. That statement makes no sense. They will have gained weight, and they did. And gradually, they'll, you know, their physical strength will return. But that doesn't mean that they left this behind them. And we become what I discovered as I began looking at hundreds and hundreds of these testimonies is that the narrative involved two stories. The chronological story, I was born in the town of so-and-so, and I grew up and went to school. When the Germans came, we were sent here. We went to a ghetto, to a camp. I survived, my parents were killed, and my brothers, my sisters. After the war, I came to America. There's a chronological story, and it does proceed from past to present to future. But the other story, what I call the durational story, focuses on moments like these, and this will be clearer from the other tapes I show, which do not recede into the past and do not alter in the future. They're, they just remain fixed in memory. Just by accident, when I was in the hotel after lunch today, I turned on CNN, CNN and they were showing the, um, the uh, speeches from the Holocaust Memorial Museum that opened today. And after that, um, they showed just one woman. They showed a picture of her as a little girl when she was um, uh, in her village. And they shot her father before her eyes, but she jumped out the window and escaped. She was 16, I think, and ran to a convent where they gave her a crucifix and clothes, kept her there for a short time, but then they were afraid the Germans were um, uh, visiting all the convents, and so they said she couldn't stay there, and eventually she was caught and sent to Majdanek, and but she survived. And she's now in her 70s, and someone was interviewing her, and the story she was telling is this. While she was weeping, she says, I remember when I was in Majdanek, I was next to another woman, and she had her bread ration for the night, and I stole her bread ration, and I ate it myself. And then she weeps, and she says, that night that woman died of starvation. And then she weeps again. She said, every day of my life, she's in her 70s now, every day in my life, I wonder if I hadn't stolen her piece of bread, would she still be alive today? And then she weeps again. Now, you can do nothing about that. We don't even know if she were instrumental in her death. If she was starving to death, she might have died anyway. That makes no difference. Chronologically, this woman came to America, grew up, had a family, got married, had a family, grew older, and that was fine. In the durational part of her existence, she has never forgotten a single day, that single act at that moment of stealing bread because she was starving herself and eating it, uh, and then wondering every day what if I hadn't done that? And there's no way she can ever escape that. She lives that as vividly as she lives her chronological life. And as you watch these more and more carefully, begin to interpret them, you see that some kind of balance exists, one not compensating for the other. It would make no sense for her to say that my chronological life, I'm married, I had children, I have grandchildren, compensates for the day I stole the bread of that woman and she died that night of starvation lying next to me. It's not a matter of one compensating for the other. And the problem that or the tension that emerges from these tapes is the anguish, and you'll see this in a minute, in the faces and in the narrations of the uh, witnesses as in their own minds and imaginations and memories, they try to find some way of reconciling it and realize that they can't. They are doomed and fated to live with these twin narratives. It's what I call in my book, Unreconciled Understanding. They understand the difference between the two. They understand that they'll never reconcile one against the other. And one reason I think I'm talking about this tonight and you're here and we still 
uh, wrestle with the pain of the Holocaust is that there simply is no way um, to, as a Someone said at one time, to clean your dirty linen after all the people who soiled it are dead. There's no way she can do anything about that. She was not in that position because she chose to be there. She was put there by the Germans, but that is no consolation to her either. All right, so I'll talk more about that later on. Now, uh, in the one I'm about to show you, um, how shall I put this? One of our sacred icons still in civilization is relationship between mother and child. Uh, no matter how bad things get, mothers care for, nurture their children. That's the way it should be. That's the way it usually is. And sometimes, of course, it isn't. There's child abuse and so forth. But in general, that's what we expect. And that's what this woman expects. In the chronological part of her life, she, you'll see, wraps a child up, takes care of a child. Suddenly, the durational moment intrudes. As you'll see, she says, I was totally unprepared. The Jews themselves were prepared to undergo a certain amount of oppression and resettlement. They were used to that. That's the, that's the tradition that Jews have always lived with, oppression. They were unprepared for what we call the final solution, mass murder, so that when it came upon them, they didn't know what to do, and this is a classic example of that. And listen to how she describes it, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it.
Jason turned up to me. He said, for me, I was dead. I died, and I didn't want to hear nothing. I didn't want to know nothing. And I didn't want to talk about it. And I didn't want to admit to myself that this happened to me. And still up, I found the doctor who asked me to come in. And they get And they brought us in there. I mean, she saw me there. She was so happy to see me. And I just said, what is it? What has first baby? What has the baby? And right there, I said, what baby? I said to the doctor, what baby? I didn't have a baby. I didn't love any baby. That's what it did to me. Now, notice the estrangement there as the camera pans from her to her present husband, Jack, about whom she says, Jack didn't know anything about this. It was only recently that I told it to him. In her chronological life, Jack is part of her chronological life, her second husband whom she met after the war and married. She has a family with him. She has a whole other life in what I call her durational time, which she kept concealed from him. He knew nothing about it until recently she told him, and now she tells the story of um, the baby. Um, she says at one point, I was dead, I died, and I didn't want to talk about it. That's one of the most complex concepts to understand, but many of the people in, this in these testimonies feel that, not in chronological time, because they're still alive, but in terms of what I call durational time, their Holocaust experience, they violated their destiny by staying alive. That their destiny in the camps was to be killed, almost everyone else was killed, and their staying alive is not something they're necessarily guilty about, but a violation of what should have happened to them. And when she says, I died, in a very real sense, a durational self is dead with the baby. Someone pointed out to me once when I showed this, someone in the audience said that there's an, expre there's an expression in Yiddish, which means I have a little package, literally, or I have a bundle, and it means I'm pregnant. When you say, I'm pregnant, and she talks about the baby as the bundle, which she gives away. Now, in chronological time, when someone says, what have you got there, as the German said, do you say, that's my baby? He says, oh, I see. I thought you were sneaking something through. And you go with the baby. But he said, what have you got there? She says, a baby. He says, give it to me. And she says, I was totally unprepared. Because a mother doesn't think in those terms. She's protecting the baby. Because the German, you're not allowed to take babies through. They kill the babies. He takes the baby. She says, that's the last time I saw the baby. And the look of her story, of course, is terrible. But the look of utter despair on her present husband's face as the camera pans to him and he tries to enter into and discovers that he cannot enter into her durational life because it's her and the baby. She says, I was all alone. I think I've always been alone while she's sitting next to her husband. And in her chronological life, she's not alone. And this turns up again and again on the tapes. One I'm not going to show you because I'd have to fast forward and it's too difficult. A man who begins by talking about his son's bar mitzvah. Now, Bar and bat mitzvah is one of the happiest moments in the life of Jewish parents. But instead of saying he was happy, he says it was my son's bar mitzvah, and he said, and he starts crying. He says, I was all alone. There were hundreds of people at the bar mitzvah. I was all alone. There was nobody there from my side, he says. They were all my wife's relatives. His entire family had been killed. And he starts talking about loneliness instead of the joy of his son's bar mitzvah. And his son's bar mitzvah is a classic instance of chronological time. When you reach 13, your son is bar mitzvah. It suggests that time is passing. Durational time intrudes on or invades his chronological life by reminding him that at this happy moment, it was one of the unhappiest moments of his life because it reminded him of his loss. Just as durational time invades the, the, the space between the husband and wife, he's on one side of the couch, and he's just finished his story. He ends the story by saying that he was in the infirmary with his brother, and his brother said, I'm not going to get out. Here, take my jacket. And I took his jacket, and he says, that night they took him out, and they shot him. 
and that's the end of his story. And then his wife starts to tell her story. So they both inhabit their own private loneliness as well as sharing. But visually, you see that she pulls out a kerchief, you didn't say a handkerchief, and she gives it to him. And he takes it and he says, I don't need it, and puts it down. Almost a symbolic gesture, not really, though. Uh, his grief is separate from her grief. And she can't console him for his grief. And he can't console her for her grief. And there's nothing to do about it. They're reasonable, intelligent people. They know that. Uh, you should be able to console each other, but as they reconstruct their stories, unconsolable. Now, the next excerpt is an even better example because this is the one f of the few places where literally what I call chronological and durational time intersect in the narrative because he talks about this is a man who lost everyone but his, I guess his father was the only person to survive out of 36 family members. Um, and he comes to this country and he says he couldn't conceive of getting married and having a family or building a home. And then he says, you know what a home is? A home is something you lose. That's his definition of a home. That's his memory of a home. But then he meets his present wife and he says, well, you know, we fell in love and we decided to get married. Then he tries to describe how his chronological life and his durational life intersect, not run parallel, but intersect. Mm -hmm. accidental conjunction, but illuminating, his wife is pregnant and gestating life. 
At night, he's back in the camps. The Germans are chasing him. He's trying to save his mother and sister, he said, both of whom were gassed in Auschwitz, are already dead. And each time, a bullet went through my heart. Till finally, in his chronological life, he goes into the hospital to find out why he has these pains. We know why he's having these pains. And they have nothing to do with his physical health. The doctors find nothing wrong with him. His heart is fine. But the two are meshed, and they are permanently meshed. They're inseparable. He leads his daily life, and at night, his Holocaust life leads him. And this leads me you know, to the next uh, point I want to illustrate. One of the characteristics of chronological time, that it helps to define our humanity because we can choose our future. In getting married, raising and having a family, he's choosing, he's creating and choosing his future, and um, we control our circumstances. What they have so much trouble dealing with as they reconstruct through memory their camp experience is that time in their life, those durational moments, I call them, when circumstances controlled them. He could do nothing then to save his wife and sister, not because he was a coward, not because he, wasn't, he didn't care, but because the Germans had all the power and he had none. He didn't know where his wife and sister were. Uh, he was simply out of control. The normal response, helping his mother and sister, was not possible at the time. So he's trapped between controlling his situation and not controlling his situation. And I suspect one motive behind that last paragraph in Martin Gilbert's book is to restore to us, his readers, uh, the audience of the Holocaust experience, that sense that somehow, through the spirit, if not through the body, we can still control that experience by saying that surviving was a spiritual triumph. The problem with that for me, I still remember the first survivor I asked, you know, I, her name was Jolie, and I was at a dinner with a number of people, and sitting next to her, I said, Jolie, tell me, uh, she was in Auschwitz, uh, in Buchenwald with her mother, and in fact, if any of you saw uh, some excerpts from the camp experience on uh, TV today, some of you have seen this famous picture, when Buchenwald was liberated, there's a woman sitting on the ground clasping the hand of an American GI and kissing his hand. That's this woman's mother. They survived together. But I took her and I said, how did you survive? And she took my two hands, I still remember it, my one hand and her two hands, and she said, I'll tell you how. I prayed to God every morning and he heard my prayer. And in those days, I was just beginning my work, and uh, I thought it was presumptuous for me to answer a survivor back, so I said nothing. But subsequently, uh, I've thought that if I had had the courage and insight at the time, I would have gently said to her, uh, didn't your father and your brothers and five million other Jews pray to God, and now they're dead? So how can you say that he heard your prayer, but none others? There's an inconsistency there. But she believed that because she needed to believe something. It established a cause and an effect. To believe that people survive through random accident is more than most of us are willing to accept, and I understand that. But if you listen to most of them and you ask them, how is it you're still alive? You were still alive at the end of the war. They would say, quite honestly and frankly, I was luckier than the rest. That's not a very satisfactory reading, uh, um, reason in a civilization that likes to believe in uh, our ability to make choices, which defines us as rational and spiritual creatures. Now, the next excerpt, uh, the next two excerpts have to do with hunger. It's hard when I try to, when some of my students say, how could people behave like that in the camps? And I say, did you have breakfast this morning? Well, unless they're on a diet, yes. Uh, are you going to have lunch? Yes. And dinner? When was the last time um, you didn't have a meal? I can't remember. I said, well, imagine that in the ghettos, the average number of calories allowed by the Germans to the Jews was 135 calories per day. Try to live, even if you're on a diet, 135 calories per day. And the camps is a little higher about 300 per day. Still not enough to live on. And the average length of life of a person not sent directly to the gas chambers but into the camps to work was three months, at which point you starve to death because the body had consumed all your fat and was beginning to consume the organs. You couldn't sustain yourself. The only people who stayed alive were those who either had a, an inside job or an easier job so that they didn't wear out their fat that quickly or had additional uh, food resources, some kind of additional nourishment. And in order to get additional nourishment, you did things that 
under normal circumstances you would disapprove of. Uh, recently I was reading uh, Chronicle of the Lodge Ghetto, a fascinating book, and it contains the diary of a young girl, 15 years old, who subsequently was sent to Auschwitz and was killed, but after the war they found fragments of her diary in the ruins of the ghetto and uh, printed it. And uh, the entry for one day says, I came back from work early. They lived in a tiny apartment in the ghetto. Her mother was still at work. Her father had come home. She says, I entered the apartment and I saw my father eating my mother's portion of bread for the evening meal. And she said, I looked at him and he, you know, he looked at me. He was mortified. She says, I hated him for taking my mother's bread but I understood why he was doing what he was doing, because I was starving and he was starving. I know what it's like to be starving. We don't. My students certainly don't. So when they see examples like the, this one and the one following it, maybe they'll begin to understand what it's like when you don't have choices. Uh, if you saw someone who's starving, you would find food for them. <coughs> if you were starving and they were starving and there's no other source of food, it'd be a lot more complicated. And one of the things these tapes help us to do, I think, is to enter not with understanding but with imagination, to enter imaginatively into the, what it might or must have been like for them without being able to say, I know what it was like to be in Auschwitz because that's a very presumptuous statement for someone who was not there. But to be able to say, I can imagine after having listened to three or four hundred of these what it must have been like for people there. That's a great step. It's a step we all have to take, I think, eventually, if we're going to face this honestly. And having these testimonies are an invaluable source for helping us to get there. So let's look at the next one. Chronological time choices, moral choices, we understand is between the good and the bad. And sometimes we choose the bad for whatever reason, but uh, most of us know that we're choosing the bad and not the good. 
In the camps, more often than not, the choice was between the bad and the worse. And that's not, that's in durational time, that is a choice. When you don't control your circumstances, but circumstances control you. If you look at her eyes as she's telling this story, she's ashamed at her own memory of stealing that little piece of bread. But I was, I was hungry and she was hungry, she said. And at that moment, my hungry, my hunger took priority over her hunger, even though it was her bread. She didn't think in terms of stealing, and we can't call that stealing. And you see, when I said we don't have an appropriate vocabulary, normal paradigms of the immorality of stealing bread uh, don't apply. When I told this story last week, I gave a talk um, in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. In the audience were a number of survivors. And at the end, one of them jumped up and said, you don't understand. The one thing we never did in the camps was steal bread. They would kill you if you stole bread. And he probably never did steal bread. And it's very difficult. Yeah, you're too far. No, you're too far. How did you get the, You let it go too far. It shouldn't have been. Uh, uh, let's see. It has to go back. Rewind it for about 15 seconds. We've gone past the one that I wanted to show. Just about 15 seconds and turn it off. We'll stand up. You can just turn it off. Good. Turn the sound off. Turn the sound off and... Uh, when she finishes turning it off, I'm, I'll talk in the dark, okay? Because the one we want follows this one. But um, under normal circumstances, she would never dream of stealing the bread. But she's starving. And when this survivor got up and said, no one ever stole bread, he was talking about his own story. Uh, it was hard for me to say, but I have a dozen stories like hers. And I told you one that I saw on the news today, this woman who, to this very day, can't decide whether this woman might have lived if she hadn't stolen her bread. Why does he deny? He was there himself that anyone ever stole bread. Because the implications are that when you were there, you were forced to do things which under normal circumstances you wouldn't do. That happens to be true. Once that survivor himself gets back into what I call chronological time, uh, he may not like the unflattering image of oneself in durational time that emerges from these testimonies and so discards it. Uh, the most difficult um, uh, phenomenon for me to wrestle with is the survivor who tells me none of that ever happened when I have testimony from a dozen or two dozen people that, in their cases, it did happen. Uh, but, and I have, we'll show, look at just one more story like this uh, after she finishes uh, to illustrate it. And all that means is that under those circumstances, you lose the capacity to choose that is a privilege for you and me who are well fed and live in under circumstances where it's easy uh, to do that. All right, now let's look at the next one. You can just leave it on. Is it on? Yes. All right, there's about 20 seconds of blank interval, and then we'll look at the next one. Then I want to tell about one other, which I can't show you, and then show one other, and then I'll be finished. He'll be coming on in a second. Watch his face, and particularly the very end, when he's not saying anything. Difficult <coughs> periods that you cannot, for example, in the camp of Lahrenstein. I was so hungry that I don't know what I would have paid. We were sleeping on the floor, and next to me was another camp inmate. I know how old he was, he looked old. And we just got our ration of bread. And he was already so sick that he couldn't eat that bread. And I was laying next to him, waiting that he should die, so that I can grab his bread. Now watch his face. This is where interpretation this is what I call the elephants of silence. This is full of meaning, this moment. 
He chooses that word very carefully, waiting that he should die so I could, and then he pauses and he searches and he doesn't say eat or take, he says grab his bread and the implications of the grabbing like a starving animal. And he's not boasting, he's simply telling the truth. He says I was so hungry that I don't know what I would have ate. Uh, that's not sinister to you, but it's sinister to me. In the tapes I've watched, I've encountered 14 narratives of cannibalism, two of which in testimonies I did myself. And you just imagine talking to someone who described that to you as the participant in it. Uh, and for every one of those 14, I am convinced there are another 40 or 50 that people don't tell me or talk about because they're unwilling or unable to put it on tape because they're spouses, their children and grandchildren are going to watch those tapes to say nothing of strangers and they don't want to talk about it. But these 14 have talked about it because they're committed to telling the whole story. It's easy enough to blame people for that. And uh, in chronological time, maybe people are blameworthy for doing it, but under those circumstances where one has absolutely no control of the situation, it's at least questionable. Now, I wish I could show you the next one. Um, I can't because I promise I did this interview myself, but uh, for reasons you'll understand maybe when I read you the fragment of testimony, even though she lives on the East Coast and I'm in the West, she doesn't want anyone to see her face. I mean, there's an odd um, contradiction. She was willing to tell the story on videotape and then she doesn't want anyone to see it. But it illustrates, I think, very uh, forcefully what I mean when I talk about the uniquely imprisoned persis persistence of certain events in the memory of the witnesses, and we've already seen some, some examples of that. Uh, this is the testimony of Anna S. That's not her name, uh, but that's the name I'm using. She married at 18 because her parents thought that her husband might help her better to survive in the harsh conditions under Nazi rule. But after the Germans invaded their home one night, shot her father and brother, and she was hiding behind some logs and witnessed the entire thing and described it with such vividness you think it would have had happened yesterday, every detail. Um, after that, she and her husband and her mother managed to hide or to flee, and then the husband and wife are separated, and she and her mother are sleeping in barns, and he leaves with his two brothers for the forest. She finds out subsequently that the three brothers were captured by the Gestapo and tortured to death, all three of them. So she's left with her mother. All this time, she was pregnant. And as she neared her term, her mother insisted that they find quarters in a nearby ghetto. And here she gives birth while she's suffering from typhus in a cold, tiny room where, she tells us, she's sleeping in a crib. Others are sleeping beneath it because that's the only available bed. When she goes into labor, her mother rushes out to find a neighbor who had promised to help with the delivery. And while her mother is gone and she's alone in this crib, the baby is born. And the testimonial moment begins here. Anna, which is not her name, she says, and I was burning up with typhus, and then the baby came out. And the interviewer, who is me, says, stillborn? And she says, hmm? Interviewer, stillborn? She says, no. And the interviewer says, alive? She says, it was alive, it was alive. Was it a boy or a girl? Boy. Yes, he was born alive, and we didn't have a doctor's no question. We didn't have a midwife to take the baby. At this point, she tells of her mother running out in search of the neighbor, returning just after the birth has occurred. And then she resumes and notice her utter inability to reconstruct these moments in any kind of chronological order. The durational moment in her memory is all confused. She can't say this and this and then and then and then. It doesn't happen in that way. So she says, so finally, finally, I don't know how long it took. I was unconscious. I was like, I knew it happened something now. I couldn't, I don't know, I couldn't respond to anything. And then finally she came in. I don't know how long she was there. I heard, and she goes, <coughs> he, was, he was choking, he was choking. And then she whispers, and he died, he died. When she came, he was dead already. After a minute, I woke up and gave a look. It was a beautiful boy, a beautiful boy. 
the interviewer, so you were alone all that time? And she says, yes, I was alone. And next to mine bed, mine crib, was a man dying. And I opened my eyes and I looked at him and he was dying and I fall asleep. That's the end of that fragment. Holocaust testimony enacts a resistance against the efforts of time to erase experience without a trace. How could Anna's words reveal to us what that moment must have been for her? What it remains, not in conventional memory, since obviously she's not remembering a forgotten moment. Her uttering of details, naming what we might consider the unthinkable. Her enactment for us of the truth, and at the same time, this self is not that self. Me telling you the story is not that woman who had that baby. And is that self, she's remarried, she has three daughters, uh, she has grandchildren, but she's also that self. Our difficulty in finding a familiar context or designation for what she describes, our inability to detect through a sequence of events the presence of a guilty agent somewhere in the obscurity of the past who killed that baby. It choked to death on the afterbirth because, as she says earlier and later in the testimony, she was simply too weak to sit up and pick up the baby and started breathing. So it choked to death. Who's guilty of that? All of these together are gathered in a kind of cornucopia of diverse causes, which in the end don't explain things to us, but paralyze our capacity to judge or evaluate, or maybe even respond. It left me numb when I heard the story. We're confined and consumed by the moment of the narrative, which is not a moment in sequential time, mesmerized by duration until chronology disappears from consciousness. And these segments of testimony enable us, I think, to experience the effects of Holocaust duration as no other form of expression can. Now, true, clearly, these are pre-selected moments, and this was a pre-selected moment, but there are hundreds and hundreds of them. And when you accumulate them, you get a vision of what I call duration, durational time must be for the witness. Now, I want to show you just one more excerpt, and uh, then I'll finish, and then I hope we can have um, some dialogue. Notice, as this last one uh, tells her story, um, that nature, what we consider nature and the natural is so inverted by what she's, what she's experiencing in that moment um, that she completely loses her sense of what her role is as, as a woman and a human being. Listen carefully to her description of the sun and the sunrise. Um, one is forced to question, she's forced to question, you'll hear her culminating question, the very basis of spiritual reality. Let's look at this, this is the last one, I'll say another word or two, and then I promise you I'll be finished. I had such 
Shirley Gondel, to run, to just run away and never come back, to run to the end, and there is no way back. And I told the girls, and girls, you have no idea how beautiful the sun is, and I saw a baby was crying, and a woman was kissing that baby. This is such a serious lot. Last question is yes, what else can it be? In chronological time, if it weren't, I couldn't do this work and they couldn't go on living. But when we be understand that during what I call durational time, the frightening and to me terrifying possibility is that the answer to that question for them was no, then we've entered the heart of their darkness and we've begun, if not to understand, at least, at least we've begun to imagine what it must have been like for them. I thank you very much.